Hey Toronto, I'm Dave Dubbin and welcome to How's the Market podcast, where we take a look at everything that's going on in the Toronto real estate market. I'll do a quick introduction of myself to you. So I've been in real estate for almost 10 years. I'm a broker with Sotheby's International Realty and a team leader. We cover mainly Western Toronto and the GTA, but do occasionally go up north to cottage country and have investors looking all over Ontario. Uh, I'm Joined by my co-host here, Ken. Hey everyone, I am Ken Mazurk. I am the Regional Managing Broker for Southwest Ontario with Sotheby's International Realty Canada. I currently manage five offices and over 100 agents and staff. The offices are located in the Kingsway neighborhood of Toronto, Mississauga, Oakville, Hamilton, and Niagara-on-the-Lake. And I'm excited to share with you some of the insights, data that we're seeing in the GTA market. First off, let's take a look at the numbers of what went on last year in 2022. We can review that, share some stories about what we've seen, boots on the ground, what's going on in terms of uh, buyers and sellers and investors. And then later on, we can uh, look forward to what to expect. All right, let's take a look at the final numbers for the Toronto Real Estate Board for 2022. And so a big thing that you always probably hear, you're hearing a lot in the media is what average prices are doing, number of sales, number of listings. We like to share this slide. I always like to pull it up for a little bit of context. So when you're seeing in the media, Toronto numbers, this is the area that they're referring to. So the Toronto Regional Real Estate Board, TREB, goes basically all the way up. You can see the Innisville goes west to Burlington, Milton, and all the way east to Clarington. So it's a massive, massive area. So even though they call it the Toronto real estate market, it really is the greater Toronto area market. And this is just a good snapshot at what we've seen. 2022 for me, I'm not sure about how you feel about it, Dave, was a period of three markets almost really at the beginning of the year from kind of January to let's say March was that real peak exuberance. Prices were shattering records, pretty much all areas of the greater Toronto area, 416, 905, we're seeing record sales, record prices, record activity. Then from April, I would say to July, we really saw that, that steep decline and that coincided with rapid rises of interest rates. So we had several large increases to the key lending rate with the Bank of Canada. Mortgage rates rise very rapidly and we almost just saw an instant kind of just dip in the market. Everyone was just pulling back, unsure how to essentially operate within this new market. It was very different from what we had seen for basically the past decade. And then August or September to December, we've seen a bit of a leveling out in terms of number of sales, in terms of number of new listings, in terms of price and overall activity. So it's been really a tale of three different segments throughout the course of the year. The high exuberance at the start of 2022, record prices, record sales, that really steep decline happening from April to August, and then leveling out once the large increases had stopped and we got more to the 50 and 25 basis point increases from the Bank of Canada. And you can see, if you look at the monthly statistics on the left-hand side here, it really just shows that February was the peak for all of the GTA. The average home was selling for $1,334,000. And now currently at the end of the year as of December, the latest data we have, we're sitting at 1,050,000. So there is, about a 20% decrease from the peak of what we saw in February, but relative to 2021's numbers were still up. Obviously you have to take that with a grain of salt because there was a huge increase at the beginning of the year, followed by a decrease in a leveling off at the end. The average sale price for 2021 was 1,095,000. The average sale price for 22 was 1,189,000 with the December price being slightly below, that's an important thing to remember. December of 2021, the average home was selling for 1,157,000. For December of 2022, just this last month, it was 1,051,000. So we are below in terms of the same time last year, but once again, always keeping in context, December of 2021 was when we really started to see that kind of rise, that rapid increase in pricing that carried on into the first few months of 2022. Anything you want to add to that, Dave? I'll just add that for the next few months moving forward, we're going to continue to see that drastic change with the market really peaking in February and March. So just, you know, be aware when we see the stats come out that that's why there's going to be such a drastic difference when you look year over year numbers. Yeah, and it's interesting too, because when we look, 2021 was really a record-breaking year, right? Prices pretty much were on an upward trajectory. Most of the year, we had huge numbers of sales, 
And what we've seen for the second half of 2022, we're about half of the activity. You know, when you're looking at September, October, August, November, basically from August to November of 2021, we were averaging around 9,000 sales a month. Whereas August to November of 2022, the exact same time period, we were closer to about 4,500, 5,000 sales. So the number was roughly cut in half. And honestly, that's what I would expect given everything that's happened in the world, right? Especially with rising mortgage rates and everything else, supply chain, you name it. But really the story has been the effect that rapidly rising interest rates, it really a tightening of money has had on the market in such a short period of time. So how does that translate to buyers and sellers? What we saw is at the start of the year, we were in a low inventory, but a fast inventory. So there was such high demand that properties would sell so fast. A lot of bully offers, properties wouldn't even make their offer dates and transitioning to a low inventory at the end of the year with low number of transactions. So it's become a lot easier for buyers, but there's very little to choose from. It's drastically changed on how to navigate it if you're looking to buy or sell right now. We do currently see properties that are well-priced, prepared for the market, still getting multiple offers, over 10 multiple offers in some scenarios. So there still is a demand, but it seems like all the inventory that's currently out there is blemished in some way, You know, whether it needs a renovation or you're backing on to train tracks or a commercial space. So there's challenges in terms of how to navigate it. Yeah, absolutely. We've really seen a transition in buyer behavior from at the start of the year, people were acting solely on their needs. There was low inventory. It was a very competitive seller's market. So buyers really had to focus on what they needed, right? I need X number of bedrooms. I need parking. And they were willing to sacrifice a lot of other things to get their needs less than they had to, because they were often in multiple offers in highly competitive situations. Fast forward towards the end of the year. Buyers are now operating on wants. They have a little more time. They can afford to be a little more patient. So now they're saying, okay, not only do I want four bedrooms, I want a certain lot size. I want to ensure that I'm close to family. I want a basement that has a walkout to it. I want a garage rather than just a parking space. So buyers have definitely slowed down. And given the fact that properties aren't selling, you know, 120% over asking price within a week with multiple offers, they have a bit of ability to do that. Um, the flip side, however, too, has been the number of new listings has dried up from August to November. We really, and now December, I can include that in there because they just released the data. We had 20 year lows in terms of number of sales, yeah. but on the flip side, we also have 20 year lows in terms of the number of new listings. So there isn't this huge glut of new inventory and product that's sitting out there it still remains very scarce for a qualified buyer to find something. Something very common that we're seeing is sellers that are, are listing their properties. They say, I want to get this number. I'll put it up on the market for X amount of time. And if, if I don't get the number that I'm looking for, I'll, I'll put it up for lease. And with such a shift in demand from the purchase side to the rental side, they're getting record numbers for rentals. And a lot of sellers are opting to, hey, I'll lease it out for a year or two, kick the can down the road, and then we'll reevaluate then. Yeah, it's been a running joke that I hear from a lot of other professionals in the industry is sellers are living in the past, buyers are living in the future, right? If sellers are still looking at kind of peak pricing and saying earlier in the year, they were able to get X for their house and I expect to be somewhere close. And it's no longer realistic given the current mortgage rate environment that we're in. And buyers are looking and projecting out into the future, like, oh, next year prices could be even lower. So why would I pay this? So you have this kind of log jam where Sellers are looking backwards, buyers are looking forward, and it's causing a lot of people to not proceed with transactions. It's really limiting the number of deals getting done because you're dealing with a smaller group of buyers and sellers that are honest about current market conditions, right? Yeah. You can't really, it's difficult to buy a house for what you think it might be worth in a year's time. You can't sell a house for what it was worth a year ago either, right? You have to operate within the current market conditions. And it's a reality that some people are accepting and others aren't. And as you say, they look at alternatives of, I don't need to sell right now. I can try again at a later date or, Hey, the rental market's great. Perhaps I lease my property out. There hasn't been, um, any real movement in this standoff between buyers and sellers. Yeah. At the moment. yeah. It's when you look at it as a whole, the GTA does have a supply issue and depending on what happens with monetary policy it shifts it from buyers to, to renters and it's, Hey, 
people still need a roof over their head, a place to live, a place to call home. And it just depends on if they're going to rent it or purchase it. We're lacking that supply. And I'm not sure that's going to be changing anytime moving forward, especially with builders looking at, at canceling new developments or deferring them because of rising costs of materials and to do business with interest rates. Yeah, and another interesting kind of angle or perspective to take on it as well is when we looked at the Terranet numbers from last year, investors or people who purchased multiple properties, they made up about 25%, 26% of the market, of the real estate market. That's a quarter, that's a significant number. And then first time buyers was the second group right behind them. Those are the two largest buying categories and arguably they're the two most affected buyer categories by rising interest rates. If you're an investor, it all comes down to your monthly carrying costs, your cash flow. In Toronto, I don't think anyone has used cap rates in 10, 15 years because they just don't really work in Toronto. Um, they they it don't was, want to know how negative it is. Yeah, but what we what you still had was investors looking at their bottom line of, okay, how much am I putting in? What is my carrying costs for this? And as interest rates have risen, a lot of the investors, 25% of the market is now waiting. They're pulling back and saying, let's take some time. First time buyers, unfortunately, have also borne the brunt of these rising interest rates because they're getting, with the stress test, they're getting tested at extremely high interest rates now. So they've kind of lost 20% of their purchasing power and they don't have that equity of a home to also use. When you're a move up buyer, it's relative, right? Whatever the value of your home is doing is what the market in general is doing. So you have that equity that you can always add to it. Whereas if you've just been in cash and you're a first time buyer, every time the stress test goes up, you know, the interest rates go up, you're being qualified at a higher rate and you're losing some of your purchasing power. So when you look at 50% of the market being drastically affected by rising interest rates, not to mention people already have a property, right? Or the move up buyers, they're obviously looking at the numbers and saying, does it make sense to move? But really that 50% of investors and first time buyers, those are the ones that have pressed pause for the time being, right? They're just waiting to see what's going to happen. Are you finding that with a lot of your clients? I think the biggest opportunity for buyers right now in any market, you can transact in real estate and you can do it effectively and can do very well. Um, it, it's just how you navigate it. Right now, the biggest opportunity for buyers I find is that move up buyer that if they do have the opportunity to maybe port a mortgage with a very desirable rate and, and get a blended rate, uh, because the asset class they're moving into, whether it's a detached or semi-detached or, or a townhouse, that price has come down be a higher percentage than the, what they're moving out of. That's where the really big opportunity is. We've started to see a few of the fire sales or people need to liquidate their homes or if it's an investment property, but it's not going to be 2008 in, in the States. So th there's a few of them out there, but a lot of buyers, I feel like have gone from a state of fear of missing out FOMO in the beginning of the year now to, to agreed where they want the seller to feel some pain. And, and it's, <laughs> it's going to take a while for that to balance out and for both sides to even out and feel actually where the market is before we start to see more transactions. I think definitely Q1, maybe Q1 and Q2, we're going to see limited number of transactions more than we've had in 2022, but I think it's still going to be lower inventory lower number of transactions. The interesting thing that, that I'm watching it for is off-market deals, properties that may not have sold uh, in the previous two years. Going back to check those out, ones that act, were actually sold, weren't sold, but ended up listing for lease and, and got leased out. And so now we're halfway through that year, the lease term, and maybe it's something that we can look at approaching them with a longer close. I also think that there's going to be a lot of properties out there where people are quietly listing them because they're just saying, Hey, if I can get this, I'm going to bow out and maybe look at, at moving to something else, or if they have to sell, but they want to do it without the sign in the front yard, uh, advertising it. Yeah. It's a very different mentality for all of 2021. It was basically get it on the MLS. Cause if I don't, I might be leaving money on the table because of the exposure, the competition, it was the way that every single seller decided to go. Whereas now we've gone to a bit more of, as you're saying, sellers interested in moving, willing to make a change, but they don't want to put their property on MLS, fear that it gets stagnant, that people will start to say, why hasn't this sold yet? So they are once again, relying on really old school real estate networking of, Hey, I have clients that's not on the MLS yet, but if I got the right price, the right situation, the right closing, they definitely be open to selling. And to your point as, as well, about what people are going to do Q1, Q2 of this year of 2023, I love my analogies. I feel a lot of people are still waiting until they have a really clear sense of where rates are going to stabilize. A lot of buyers right now, I get the sense of that it, you're trying to run a race, but you don't know how far you got to run with the rates kind of constantly going up. Obviously. 
if I say, hey, let's have a race and I say it's going to be 100 meters, you're going to run it one way. And then if I turn and say, well, actually, it might be 400 meters or it might be 1,000, you're going to approach that very differently. And because interest rates have been moving up, buyers are just looking for a sign as to when is it going to stabilize? Yeah. Uh, obviously we're going to stabilize and stop shifting under my feet. yeah when am i going to know the rules of the game it's very tough to try and purchase when the ground when the market is shifting and when the fundamentals behind you are, are moving and to further to that point as much as i talked about first-time buyers and investors holding off you you mentioned there are people transacting in this market right there are four thousand five thousand sales still happening every month even with these market conditions because there are opportunities for move up buyers and life goes on. I have a newborn at home. Eventually babies are born. People unfortunately pass new jobs, right? Lifestyle. So there are people who, no matter what the market's doing, they will transact. They will buy and sell because life events happen. You can't stop them. Sometimes it's just the way it is. Right. It's often talked about the three D's of real estate, <laughs> death, divorce, and debt. Life happens and expanding families happen. Relocations happen too. Life goes on. It, it feels to me, just talking to my clients and my team, a lot of it felt like going back to the start of COVID with so much uncertainty and so much negativity in the media. It's like, we don't know what's going to happen. But I remember at the start of COVID, I, I put up a condo listing, nothing special, 500 square foot condo and volume of showings was way down. I think we ended up selling it to somebody who did the virtual online tour first. And there was a condition that they viewed it in person, but we navigated it and the transaction happened within the first two weeks of a lockdown and life goes on. People learn how to navigate it and people still want to want a home to invest in real estate. And they're just taking time to understand what's going on with the market. And it, it can be somewhat confusing, especially when you look at the messaging from the Bank of Canada. It's okay, our interest rates gonna stay low for a long time. Okay, they didn't stay low. Okay, they raised rapidly. And you're telling me this might, we might be near the end, but you're also telling me there's gonna be more. I just don't know anymore. I have some buyers who are a little defeated or they're just like, you know what, let's just, let's just do it if we can get the right number. And then we'll look at probably something with a fixed, maybe two or three year term. And then hopefully things are gonna be a lot better. By then. And it's the lens of time that which you view a purchase, right? In any market, right? The Toronto market has been one of the strongest in the world for well over a decade. We've had the most new construction. We're always number one on the crane index. We've been attracting you know, new international buyers. We've been a real, we've become a very global city and the growing pains that come with being a global city. But even in those markets, flippers and people trying to make a quick buck still lost money, right? Even in those great markets. So, you know, as we transition now, there's obviously going to be more pain and it's always the speculators who are going to pay the biggest cost on that. The unfortunate will be families who stretched because they needed a home. Like I said, a life event had them get there. But once again, if you're confident, if you're saying, Hey, what five, 10 years down the road is this going to look like? I'm still a big believer in 10 years from now, it's going to be where I want to live. It's a sound investment. I don't have any plans on moving. I'll weather some short-term pain and knowing that I have something that I love, the home that I love and something that I'm going to use for a long time. Absolutely. If you're looking at how do I do compared to last month versus if you're like, how did I compare to the last decade? Very different scope there. And as you have said for your buyers, right? Your clients, and I hear it a lot, is the toughest thing or the part of the toughest job that we have as realtors is that moment of truth where you're negotiating, you're going back and forth, and then you get that price that everyone seems to be okay with. And they say, is this a good decision? What are the risks? And every market has inherent risks, right? For, like we said, for the past decade, the risk had been, you know, I, I love my analogy, is going to use another one. It was a train leaving the station, right? If you had a certain budget, prices were going up exponentially. And if you didn't Great jump in, let me take notes here. Okay. We're going yeah. <laughs> train X, yeah. train Y. Was, I'll start throwing some movie references in there. We're going to be good. But it was, I always used to say to clients, it's like a train leaving the station. If you have a budget rates are so low, prices are going up every month. It's been basically that way for years and years. You had to jump onto the train and get a property and then get part of that appreciation, that capital gain where you missed it. And then you were renting and you'd be hoping for a downturn where, you know, so the risk there was the FOMO because I don't get in when I need to, and I get priced out. Now the shoes on the other foot, the risk is on the other side. It's the fear of missing out has been replaced with the fear of paying too much and people overpaying or, okay, is this going to be, is my property going to be underwater? Or am I going to owe more than it's worth? So every market there's been risks and i find it's only through kind of the lens of time you know how long are you willing to stay how long are you willing to look at your decision that you'll know if it was a good one it's very hard to gauge i used to coach as you can probably tell as a bunch of footballs and helmets and stuff so i used to coach football for over a decade 
and play it. But there's always risks in every in everything you do, and it's really where do you want to place the risk? Where's the comfort? And in sports, right, there's always the trade talks. You trade a player and everyone immediately wants to grade it and all oh, this has worked out for both teams. You don't know until four or five, maybe 10 years at the end of a player's career, which could be a yeah. decade later. And it's very similar with a lot of business deals, right? Absolutely. With a lot of real estate transactions. You don't know until you have the benefit of hindsight to look back and say, how did I do? I'm sure there are people, you had clients, I'm sure they're the same. They bought a house in 2017 and it was a record price on the street and they went, oh my God, this is insane. What have I done? This is crazy. Even today with a downturn, they're still up several hundred thousands of dollars and they go, wow, that was the best decision I've ever made in my life. But you can only have that with time, with hindsight. Absolutely. I think that this is a far better market for a buyer to navigate in. You actually get the opportunity to do a home inspection, have a condition of financing, and th there's lots of opportunities in terms of like vendor take back mortgages. You actually have an opportunity to negotiate and navigate it versus you have to line up with 10, 20 other people and you're probably paying over what the property's worth by a small amount just to secure the asset and, and to get in. Yeah. And it's the fear that was really pushing that. I think people are gonna look back on this time and 2023 as a whole is an opportunity where if you had the cash and the opportunity to get into the market, there's going to be some great deals out there for people. Absolutely. And we were, I know you've heard me say this in some of our meetings and conversations like Toronto and Vancouver, I would also maybe put into that. We were such outliers in our globally. I had two clients that I was selling that I was the listing agent for two luxury condos and both of the sellers were international, both from the United States. And we sold both their condos. And I remember when we were negotiating the offer, both of them say, well, how long is like the escrow period on it? Well, how long are the conditions on this? And they say, well, there are no conditions. It's like a cash offer. You sign this, you've sold, it's a yeah. firm sale. There's nothing. And they said, a $3 million property, there's no escrow. I'm like, nope, you sign it. And they, like both of them just went, that's crazy. That is actually crazy. They're like, we get prices, you know, home sell over. But to skip escrow and all these steps just seemed absolutely insane to these people. And they obviously lived in Canada for a time. They knew Canada. But just when we look at our market compared to how the rest of the world functioned, we were very much an outlier in terms of, as you're saying, you had to get rid of your due diligence. A lot of buyers skirted their due diligence or you were trying to do it yeah. so in this really rapid pace, right? Let's break down escrow and how real estate works. If you're buying a property in the United States or somewhere else in the world, you go see the property you do submit an offer, maybe there's some back and forth on the price, but there is a, a longer due diligence period. And we'll see a lot more properties in those markets that uh, price is agreed to, but they don't actually close. Both parties might have exits within that conditional period. Yeah, absolutely. Price, closing date, those sorts of major, what's included with the sale. But then there are conditions or it gets put into escrow with financial appraisal on the property, with satisfactory financing, with a home inspection, maybe repairs, right? Like it was yeah. even in the US market where it was quite hot, it was very commonplace, even when you paid over asking to still have an escrow period and the seller might've done some repairs on a property, right? They might've given you an adjustment on closing to fix things where we just did not have that in Toronto. It was people were fighting and very grateful just to get a property, to get a home, right? And they were willing to make sacrifices for that. And on the flip side, sellers, a lot of people say, I didn't sell for the same price that I might've gotten had I sold earlier. It's all relative. If you're buying and selling in the same market, that, that's the caveat, right? You have to buy and sell in the same market. But if you know, you're selling a semi-detached home in Toronto and upgrading to a detached, if your property is appreciated for $400,000 in the time you've been living there, you better believe the detached home you're buying has probably also seen similar growth. So you're trading that equity for another property, essentially. You're not really moving the needle. The only people who essentially really cashed out or won are people who went to new markets where home pricing was half what it was, Toronto's, or maybe they were downsizing, they were going into rentals. That was the only people who really captured a lot of that equity. But if you were staying in Toronto, you're paying from, you were putting equity from one property and using it to purchase another. It was really a trade yeah. more than anything. Any predictions for next year for 2023? I hate using the word predictions. I do not like to predict. I will say things to look out for or uh, things that I will be watching. I'll phrase it that way. Okay. Give um, me the firm maybes for 2020. The firm maybes. I'll give you my firm maybes. The big thing I'll be watching is inventory levels in our market. So as I mentioned last year in December of 2021, that was really, it started in November, but December was really where it took off. The absorption rate, the, the number of new listings to sales was over 100%. I believe it was around 120%. Wow. 
So that meant basically anything that had been on the market throughout the course of the year was just getting bought up. So we entered 2022 with essentially no inventory. We were at minimal all time lows for TREB stats. This year, it's going to be different. We have a much higher number of active listings. We're substantially up from the same time last year. I won't use the year over year. I always prefer to use three and five year averages because last year was a bit of an outlier, but how much of that's going to get absorbed the past three, the past four months, sorry, we've sat around the 45, 50%, which is healthy and that's fine. I'll be curious if that number increases, decreases and what that does relative to the number of new listings. Cause to me, if we continue to see limited inventory coming on and the absorption rate of that inventory remains pretty steady, I think we'll start to maybe see some upticks in quarter two, quarter three, in terms of sales, if that absorption rate drops and inventory builds up, it might be longer, right? It could be far more of a waiting game and a downturn for sellers. So that's what I'm really looking at is the months of inventory. So how much we have in the market, the absorption rate and the number of new listings and active listings. And if you're ever reading Treb stats, just so everyone knows, new listings are when a property gets put onto the MLS system. Anytime a property goes up, it's a new listing. Even if it's a property, let's say they've been offered at 1.5 million, then they reduce it and put it at 1.3 million. That counts as two new listings, just so everyone knows. Um, whereas active listings is the number of properties at the end of the month that are still on the MLS system. So active listings is a good measure to see how much is getting absorbed as well as the, the sales to listing ratio, also known as the absorption rate. So that's gonna be the big thing I am watching. My very long-winded maybe answer is that number, I think will probably dictate what quarter one and quarter two looks like. How about yourself, Dave? Any bolder predictions than the maybes I'm offering? Yeah, a little bit bolder. I, I think we're gonna see more listings and in, an increased number in new listings, and we're gonna have an increased number in transactions than 2022. I see that as the volatility in interest rates, we're not going to have a rapid increase or decrease like we did the previous year. It takes about 45 to 50 days for people to get comfortable to change and understand. And now they're looking, okay, I think I have a better idea of what's going to happen here. I know how to navigate my next move and they're going to just be more comfortable doing it. Yeah, is, is what's going to be the full force, but sales could foreseeably pick up. It was once again, because last year was so unique where the first three months of the year, we had this massive number of sales. And then it declined and leveled out. It'll be very interesting to see what the 2022 levels are and to see what the seasonality of our market is. I expect we will see more seasonality than we have in the past. I think we'll see more of a traditional spring market, a traditional fall market with less activities and in, in the winter, right? To start the year, January, February, typically they're supposed to be slower months for real estate. It hasn't been the case the past two years and as well as the summer months. So I think we will see more of that as people are starting to travel again, life is returning quote unquote, back to a more normal state. People are just not as interested in looking at houses. You got fluctuating interest rates. You don't know where those are going to fall. Kids have a break. Why house hunt in February? Let's go on vacation, right? Yeah. In terms of, I'll do the fun one in terms of what the Bank of Canada is going to do. I think in 2023, we're going to see uh, both an increase and a decrease in the rate. It's a bold prediction. I'm going to say moderate increase and then a holding flat. I do not, unfortunately, see a decrease. Once again, I will tell everyone I'm not an economist and I probably, much like many of you, have never been as interested about Bank of Canada announcement rates as you have been over the past uh, 18 months. Were they a thing before this year? Yeah. <laughs> it came and went, right? I'm sure we all remember for much of 2020, 2021, even 2019, pretty much as far as I can remember for the past five, six years. It was maybe an email you got from a mortgage broker. Maybe it appeared on your Google news feed and you just went about with your life. Whereas now people are, I feel it's like they're gambling on it. Okay. What are we talking? 25, 50, 75, like it's everyone's hanging out of the edge of their seat to see what it is. Pair that with the inflation numbers as well. That was another metric that I don't think people were really worried about up until last year. Everyone Unless has a doctorate honest. in economics. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And once again, there are people with PhDs who do this for a living, who are likely far better at predicting it. But once again, I find a lot of these predictions, people will make them and then they don't revisit them. So I'm going to make yeah. a far tamer prediction. We can revisit it and you can hold me accountable for that one. And one thing too, if you want a prediction that I will actually stand by, and I think is a valid one is I think we will start to see, there's always been a regionality. In Canada, we're a massive country. The Calgary market is so different from Toronto's, Vancouver compared to Halifax, Montreal, the Saskatoon. 
that gets lost a lot of the time because our a lot of the media kind of gets dominated by the Toronto and Vancouver numbers and the Korea numbers, the Canadian Real Estate Association's national numbers sometimes get a little lost. I think we'll start to see in 2023 real separation in different regions of Canada. Even like looking at Alberta, Calgary has been, performed incredibly well, relatively speaking, to some other markets in Canada. The Maritimes, Quebec, I'll be very, I, I think we'll start to see a real almost bit of a separation or a real difference in the performance of markets. I don't think we're going to see uniform performance. You know, everyone's going up or everyone's going down. I think we'll start to really see different markets performing very differently over the course of 2023. We've already started to see that happen in 2022 with, with the areas outside the GTA, your Niagara, yeah. your Durham's, they're the ones that's both experienced the most growth, but they're also experiencing the largest corrections. You would almost say, I'm not surprised when some areas are going up 30, 40% over a calendar year, that's a massive run up in such a short period of time. And even within Toronto, right? Like you look at the different regions in Toronto, the different neighborhoods, to your point, even just different properties on the same street. Right. But you get a long street, half of it's in one school district, half of it's in the other. That affects your sale price. That affects the marketability of your home. It was a factor a year ago. Now it's a much bigger factor, right? As I'm saying, people are looking at the wants now and they're less focused on the needs because they have the opportunity. Any other 2023 predictions you want to throw out there? I guess I can include the one we, we touched on earlier about the first half of the year being more off market transactions, easy one to throw out there because you can't really track it, but I can let you know if I did more in 2023 than I did in 2022 and previous years. Yeah. Interesting. And I'm also another market that's very hard to track is the assignment market for anyone, you know, who's watching or listening and is unaware of what an assignment is. Let's just use an example of you bought a condo in 2019. It's going to be ready for you in 2024. An assignment is essentially you selling the contract that you have with the developer to someone else, and they are going to actually close on the unit. They're going to assume possession of the units. So you never actually own the condo. You have a contract with the developer, you're selling that contract to someone else. It's been a visible market unless you operate and really work within it. That will be a very interesting market to watch because there's 37,000 new condos slated for completion. and. A lot of, I won't say a lot because I don't want to speculate at the number, but there are going to be sellers that purchase these basically as condo futures to use the lack of a better word. And they were thinking it would go up and they're going to sell it for a price. I'll be very curious to see what happens in that market. But to your point, another market that's just, it's difficult to track. There's not like a central database for those kind of sales because it's developer to developer on how they do them. It'll be an interesting market to watch or hear about anecdotally from some of our agents who really operate in that sphere. That's the biggest opportunity right now. If you said, Hey, I want to go buy a, buy a property and I want to make sure that I get the best deal on it. It's, it's picking up an assignment sale that, that somebody, they have to liquidate it because they, they don't have the means to, to close it and obtain the mortgage on it. That's, that's going to close in early 2023. Yeah, essentially when you were purchasing it, you were probably getting it at a two and a half, three percent interest rate was what they would have qualified you for. Now closing day comes and you're looking at five, maybe six percent. It's a very different story, right? For, in terms of carrying costs. Even as robust as our rental market has been, it, it still drastically changes the math on it. Thanks everyone for tuning in. If you liked what you heard today, you can do us a huge favor, hit the thumbs up like button and share it with a friend. That'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much everyone for tuning in. May your lockbox is always open on the first try and we look forward to speaking with you again soon. Take care.